Hello everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Gattu. I'm, I'm from the University of Maryland Medical Center in the Department of Pain Division Anesthesiology. I'll let you have uh, you guys have your dinner, uh, your lunch, sorry, and I'll keep talking. Uh, I hope it's okay. Anyway, my topic for today is chronic pain management for everyone, basically. And um, my, object my objectives today are just to recognize the signs and symptoms of pain and how to manage pain and how to use multimodal approaches to chronic pain and when to utilize chronic opiate therapy in the face of the current opioid epidemic. So uh, we all know that chronic pain is very distressing and it's a complex issue and it affects about more than 50 million people in the United States. The prevalence varies from 10 to 40 percent of the patients. It's more frequently seen in women and older patients and um, uh, nearly half of them receive treatment and many of them who are older uh, elderly people, they refuse to have any sort of treatment. So the commonest cause of chronic pain when they come to the primary care clinic or to the pain office is because of your spine pain. This is followed by joint pain and followed by migraine headaches. Billions of dollars are spent on chronic pain. It's not only because of the associated comorbidities. Also, it has associated psychological comorbidities such as depression, anxiety, you know, there's a lot of chemical coping, social factors, physical factors. Basically, it affects body and mind. And there is lost work days annually. That's because majority of them do apply for short absences and a few of them apply for long absences. And um, this is a very difficult phenomenon to describe. It is very, very subjective. And this is a definition that was described by the International Association of Study of Pain. Uh, it is an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage are described in such terms. If there's no insult, if there's no injury, definitely there is something else going on. Unless you do have a cause or a pathology, then you have to treat it appropriately. Uh, this is the key difference. It's very essential to know the difference between acute pain and chronic pain because treatment is entirely different. And chronic pain syndrome, they don't come with a diagnosis of chronic pain syndrome. This is just a constellation of symptoms. Chronic pain leading to uh, changes, pathological changes in your brain, and then you perceive as chronic pain. This is associated with any mood, mood disorders such as depression, anxiety, any interference with social life. Uh, like I said, it affects the body and mind. It, it's not a diagnosis, it just comes in with chronic pain. Acute pain, I'll talk about acute pain in the context of non-procedural, non-trauma, I mean major traumas, non-surgical insults because this is the major, one of the common causes of non-procedural or surgical chronic pain. They are the visits to the primary care office or to the uh, uh, interventional pain uh, centers. So acute pain is very time limited. It is self-limited. Once there is an injury, it is supposed to heal. Once healing occurs very well, then pain should dissipate. dissipate. And then uh, if pain persists, more than three months, that is called chronic pain. If patient feels better in the face of acute pain, please discontinue medications as appropriately uh, according to the clinical picture. Acute pain may have signs, uh, any changes in disturbance in the autonomic system that has increased the heart rate or blood pressure. Sometimes patients with chronic pain, they come to the clinic saying, oh, I have my blood pressure is high because of chronic pain. No, it is an autonomic adaptation. It can occur in the face of flare-ups, but it is not a chronic elevation of blood pressure due to chronic pain. So uh, again, this is a non-surgical cause of chronic pain. So uh, once we identify the difference between acute pain and chronic pain, then for acute pain, we can start with the traditional treatment with non-opiate therapy. Of course, any medications are not without any uh, uh, side effects. Astaminophen is the safest effective medication, but of course, one has to be cautious in case of elderly people with alcohol, alcoholic disease, and also um, uh, uh, um, uh, in case of uh, alcohol intoxication. Uh, astaminophen has not proven to be effective even acute pain and chronic pain, but of course we can try that uh, alternative. 
Uh, NSAIDs, of course, there is a lot of evidence showing that it is beneficial because it's anti-inflammatory medication. There's no difference between the traditional NSAIDs or the COX-2 uh, NSAIDs. Uh, NSAIDs, of course, it is also with risk. One has to be careful. Chronic use of NSAIDs can lead to problems in patients with coronary disease, hypertension, renal disease, anyone with gastrointestinal problems or bleeding disorder. Um, anyone more than three years being on an NSAID can have such problems. So hopefully it's used only on a PRN basis. Uh, muscle relaxants, preferably alpha-2 agonists because such, such as tizanidine because it, is, it potentiates the alpha-2 agonist activity and analgesia as well. Of course, they have their own side effects. Uh, the muscle relaxants have shown to be proven to be beneficial for pain and function if it's used only for a short course, somewhere around three to seven days. It is not helpful for chronic pain. Uh, Anticonvulsants have not shown to be beneficial unless they have a true acute radiculopathy or true acute neuropathic pain, then probably it can be beneficial, but evidence does not say so. Uh, cannabinoids, there's no evidence uh, showing that it is helpful for acute pain and we'll come to chronic pain on that. Topical agents can be used because of the multiple neurotransmitters and chemicals released, so we could use it. Uh, opioids, even with the CDC guidelines, 2016 CDC guidelines, they have suggested very short courses. In fact, they have mentioned only to two to three days, but of course, depending on the picture, depending on the severity of pain, you can extend it a little longer. And there's no evidence for long-term treatment of chronic pain. Um, evidence is poor unless it's patient-to-patient -patient basis. Studies suggest that patients discharged in opiates are more likely to remain on opiates one year later compared to patients who were not discharged on opiates. There are very weak recommendations and very weak uh, evidence showing that opioids beyond two weeks for acute pain is beneficial. Oral steroids have no role, even though a lot of patients request for uh, oral, oral steroid uh, medraldose pack or any form of uh, steroid therapy. Um, studies have not shown that it could be beneficial. And antidepressants, of course, we all know because the analgesic effect takes at least two weeks to kick in, so it has no role. Uh, treating acute pain with opioids. If you decide to treat somebody with opiates, somebody who has moderate to severe pain, and if they're not responding to all the traditional conservative therapies, then you could consider opiates. But however, it should be a very short course. According to much of the literature and the CDC guidelines, you do want uh, quantity limits on the medications that's being prescribed. Example, 10 to 12 tablets for two to three days. But you must help them educate and taper, taper them off. If you if you instruct them to take Q4 hours, they will take Q4 hours, they'll run up the medication and they'll go to the ER and this is gonna be a cascade. So you've gotta let them know how to wean them off. And of course, you have to, you, one has to know the risk factors. In acute pain, one does not need to know much of the risk factors because acute pain has to be treated. Um, opiates are not to be treated as anxiolytics because once there's an insult or injury, it does cause anxiety in many of the patients and it may linger on for a little while. So you could use benzodiazepines only for a short period or maybe not. They are anti-anxiety medications that can be used and that is uh, recommended. Uh, and uh, opioid prescribing does not contribute to patient satisfaction. Somehow, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, don't, I do not agree on that. Anyway, uh, studies have shown that compassion, empathy, communication, all these can improve patient satisfaction. Uh, these are the other approaches, apart from medication management, which have been proven to be very, very useful in treatment of acute pain. So when starting somebody for acute pain treatment, this has also, this needs to be incorporated as well because evidence does show good benefit in pain and function. Acupuncture, psychological approaches such as cognitive behavioral therapy and coping, counseling, offering them biofeedback, relaxation therapies. Uh, chiropractic manipulation, as not, uh, there's no proven benefit. Physical therapy, of course, strengthening and um, massages. TENS unit, complementary medicines have all been shown to be very, very useful. So,
after four weeks, what happens if patient says, oh, I'm still in chronic pain, then what do you do? You want to reassess the patient, examine again, and you would want to emphasize on continuation of low impact physical methods, that is something like exercises, physical therapy, chiropractic, manipulation. And then if there's no relief, if there are any yellow flags or red flags, you may want to consider imaging studies. What I mean to say is yellow flags is when patient has any comorbidities such as uh, history of cancer, history of uh, uh, diabetes, uh, any other, um, I'll, I'll come to that later again. And any psychological factors are there at play, sometimes chemical coping, sometimes catastrophization, all these can have a play in this. Uh, when acute pain becomes chronic, these are the risks to the provider. Majority of the pain with patients suffering from acute pain, five to 10% of them, they go into chronic pain. That is pain lasting beyond three months. And if the patient are on opioids, even after six months, likelihood they're going to have chronic pain. And acute pain, I will leave it to the surgeon or the person who's managing it because those doses are very different and the guidelines are different from chronic pain. So if we would like to obtain imaging studies, the gold standard for spine pain is MRI. MRI may show not only uh, the entire pathology, but it also shows disc herniations, infections, osteomyelitis, hematomas compared to CAT scan. CAT scan can only show you so much. If you, you are suspecting fractures, any bony involvement, then your CT comes into play. X-ray, if you want, uh, this is mostly done prior to surgery or even when uh, somebody has uh, other problems such as fractures or slippy or spondylolisthesis, then X-ray can be obtained. Uh, but X-ray proves of, uh, is of no value in chronic pain. EMG has no role in chronic pain, even in acute pain is, it has no role, unless you are confused with the picture, then EMG would be useful. But EMG presence manifests only after 21 days to one month after injury. Prior to that, you will not find any findings. Uh, these are diagno diagnostic studies. Anyone, acute pain, chronic pain, if you find any red flags such as uh, cordyquinous syndrome, incontinence of the bowel, bladder, fever, weight loss, cancers, uh, IVDA, and uh, such patients, imaging is very, very appropriate. And uh, uh, most of the surgeons do obtain imaging before surgery. And if the symptoms are really persistent, leading to chronic, severe, persistent pain, then you may want to get the, the imaging studies. If on imaging you find any pathology such as degenerative changes, it does not necessarily mean that patient has pain. But if patient has pain, one needs to correlate with the pathology. So chronic pain, when do you refer the patient to a chronic pain clinic? So once acute management is uh, completed and if patient still has chronic pain then you can refer the patient to a chronic pain clinic if patient is not yet a candidate for surgery after you send him to a surgeon they said no just conservative therapy is required then you would and then uh, uh, most of the patients after the surgery we see a lot of patients after back surgeries coming back to the clinic having pain despite the surgery that's another indication uh, these are the types of chronic pain. One has to identify the difference between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Uh, nociceptive pain is pain arising from anywhere from your skin, subcutaneous tissue, cartilage, bones, joints, muscles. Neuropathic pain is pain, any insult from the periphery or central nervous system results in neuropathic pain. So, somatic pain is again differentiated between somatic pain and visceral pain. Visceral pain is very difficult to treat and very difficult to identify as well. Because somatic pain is very well localized, you know where the uh, injury is from, resulting from, and you can treat it appropriately. Whereas visceral pain is pain arising from any of the abdominal chest cavities, and uh, it's associated with a lot of emotional disturbances, and the description is very different. Treatment is again very challenging. Neuropathic pain, these are the types of neuropathic pain, peripheral and central uh, neuropathic pain, which we do come across and we do manage pain of various pain and neuropathic pain syndromes. Uh, neuropathic pain and nociceptive pain can have a mixed mechanism, so you can utilize both nociceptive pain med uh, medications as well as neuropathic pain uh, medications to treat the mixed pictures. 
and um, these are all the mixed pictures from your spine pain, from your joint pain, from your muscle pain, from your pelvic abdominal pain, all these have mixed pictures so you can use interchange your medications from nociceptor and neuropathic pain medications. Again, neuropathic pain is a result of direct nerve injury and they should have typical sharp shooting, lancinating type of symptoms. You can have deficits. In nociceptor pain, it's just um, the pain is much, very much localized to the area of tissue injury and patient normally describes a very sharp, just localized pain. Uh, the treatment, again, is pretty much the same except you could use a little different type of medications for these types of pain. For neuropathic pain, uh, preferably antidepressants. The older ones like tricyclics, those are the ones which are preferred, but because of the side effects and everything, the, we have the newer ones like the SNRIs. Uh, I'll come to the mechanism of that as well. And then you could use anticonvulsants such as calcium channel blockers like pregabalin, gab gabapentin, or sodium channel blockers like Topamax or other anticonvulsant medications. You could use topical agents such as uh, capsaicin lidocaine plasters because of the chemicals that's released sodium, uh, other chemicals uh, that is released. No septopain, pain, of course, you're going to use your traditional NSAIDs, uh, astaminophen and COX-2 inhibitors. You can also use topical agents, opioids, reserve it if patient has failed. If they have both of them and if you would want to use opiates, you want to use a combination of uh, agents uh, which is embedded in one medication such as tapenadol or tramadol where the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake is inhibited in, in addition to a mu, partial mu agonist activity. So the reason why we use so many medications in uh, chronic pain is uh, it's because of uh, any insult uh, at the periphery. Uh, once you have a stimulus, it goes through your spinal cord, goes to the other side, goes to your brain, from the hypothalamus, goes to your brain. So on its way, in the periphery, these are the chemicals that's released, the NSAIDs, the antihistamine, the opiates, local anesthetics. So the reason we use these medications like substance B, we use the capsaicin cream, the glutamate, we use the gabapentin uh, and the uh, other pregabalins, the prostaglandins because of the traditional NSAIDs, serotonin, uh, like, uh, like the SNRIs or the SSRIs, and then the sodium channel modulation, again, the anticonvulsants and local anesthetic blockers. So that is the reason why we use a multitude of medications. This is for the peripheral uh, injury, and when modulation occurs in the um, spinal cord in the central nervous system, there are many more chemicals that's released. That's why we use a whole lot of medications to treat. So we have the excitation in the brain. You want to inhibit this excitation, and you, put in, you want to potenti potentiate the inhibition from here. That is why we use all the other anticonvulsant antidepressants, and the descending inhibition, you want to potentiate the serotonin and nor norepinephrine. The, the, this, um, of course, the role of the SNRIs, SSRIs, and opiates come into play because of the modulation on the descending inhibition. So if you want to use only opiates, it's not going to act on other neurotransmitters, patient may complain of, still complain of pain. So once you have your goals identified, uh, this has to be discussed with every patient. They have to increase physical activity and productivity. Uh, staying still, still can lead to more wear and tear and more chronic pain. And medication management should be optimized, not only in form of opiates, in form of non-narcotics as well and uh, patient function, functioning is highly important. And uh, use of non-invasive and invasive therapies to control chronic pain. So in our clinic, we use multiple approaches. This helps us not to escalate on any other medication and prevents us to add or escalate on narcotic therapy. Of course, we do have a lot of patients on chronic opiate therapy. They're in very low doses though. Uh, this is what we use, medications with, uh, non with uh, opiates and non-opiates. We do a lot of imaging, a lot of injections. Physical therapy continuously with exercises is encouraged and we have a pain psychologist on site and they help all patients utilizing a biopsychosocial model and they help them uh, undergo um, uh, coping, counseling, they offer some exercises, they offer alpha stem therapy and they screen us for opiate therapy. We do not start anybody on opiate therapy unless they're okayed by the pain psychologist. 
non-opiate medications like we just talked about, anti-convulsants, anti-depressants, muscle relaxants, NSAIDs, and topical agents. These are the basis of pain medications for chronic pain. We do not have a whole lot of pain medications, but these are the medications that is used. So the non-opiate medications for chronic pain, you could use NSAIDs. Uh, there is some benefit even based on evidence. Uh, NSAIDs could be helpful for a variety of pain syndromes or one has to be careful with the toxicity that, that is associated. The antidepressants, the, it's well known that the tricyclics are very effective based on the therapeutic blood levels, but because of the significant toxicities, we have the newer, uh, uh, newer antidepressants uh, which can be used, which can help in mood disorder, neuropathic pain, and sleep. So the other medications are anticonvulsants, which can be used for radiculopathy. We use some neuropathic pain agents, but I don't know if it's very helpful, but for any neuropathy, these agents are quite helpful. And uh, the muscle relaxants, they are not useful for, for chronic pain. If there's a flare up, it can be used short term, three to seven days. They know this, there is no difference between any skeletal muscle relaxant. Combination of muscle relaxant and NSAID alone offered as much relief as the most powerful painkiller. So there's no difference when combining NSAIDs with muscle relaxants. Uh, so if patient fails after trying non-narcotics and non-pharmacological non approaches, then you would want to implement a little bit of opiate medications. So if you want to decide whether opiates are indicated, it's more appropriate to determine whether opiates reduce pain, improve function, and result in overall enhancement of the well-being without posing any unacceptable risk or side effect. So this decision should be based solely on the entire picture. So before we start anyone on narcotic therapy, we refer them to pain psychology, but this is what we do. Um, so we identify the risk factors. Based, are they mild, moderate, or high risk? You know, the high risk, do you want to implement chronic opiate therapy on such patients? So we, we obtain a thorough physical and psychiatric history, social history, family history, then PDMP is very, very useful. It's now the mandates that we have to check PDMP, if not every two, th uh, two three months or every visit. And uh, opioid risk tools can be easily utilized by anyone. And then a formal psychological evaluation is very, very helpful. So this is the risk stratification. Anyone with depression, anxiety, you could give opiates, but you have to go deeper than that. Any history of prior hospitalizations, suicidal attempts, overdoses, uh, family history of mood disorders, substance abuse. This is very, very essential to, because all these risk factors add to the risk potential. Psychosocial factors plays a huge role because as I said, chemical coping and catastrophization is almost in 80 to 90% of our patients. Uh, unemployment, living situation, stresses at home, low socioeconomic status, poor you know, public health insurance, and somatoform disorders, legal issues, all these can contribute to poor prescribing habits with opiates. Uh, again, continuation of restratification, personal history of substance abuse. If somebody has a urine positive for cocaine, that means it's an addiction. Do not continue narcotics. You've got to wean them off. Send them to addiction or rehabilitation clinic. Current methadone maintenance, current CDC guidelines do not recommend opiate use with concurrent methadone use. Diversion, aberrancy, all these are high risk behaviors. Any history of uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, they're very high risk. High levels of pain disability, unemployment, incarceration, functional limitation, and sometimes in genetic factors, all these are very high risk factors. If patient is very high, you want to implement something, assign a proxy atoma, of course the proxy needs to be evaluated and identified as well. Um, so now if you want to initiate opiate treatment, the current recommendation is less than 50 morphine milliequivalents. Even we try to tape our patients to less than 50. Very rarely we have patients up to 90. We do not have any patients more than 90 morphine milliequivalents. Uh, unless uh, uh, certain, again, patient to patient, case by case basis. 
urine drug screen is done based on mild, moderate, and high risk factors. For high risk patients, if you want a proxy, or we want to see the patient every two weeks, or if you're giving a prescription every once a week, then of course you want to do it at every visit. For moderate, you may want to do three to four times a year. For mild, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, depending on the risk status. Always reassess goals. And the goal is to stop opiates at some point of time. Uh, however, we've been very, very unsuccessful with that. Even if we initially discuss three month uh, trial with chronic opiate therapy, it never works. So anyway, if you want, would want to continue chronic pain management, we have to have all the goals set. Mechanisms of failed analgesia, opioid non-responsive responsive pain, pain states, opioid tolerance, do not escalate medications, just do an opioid rotation, or discontinue and restart pain medications. Patient will be unhappy, but it will benefit him. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia is very, very common. Soon after the, you start the medications, patients do report more pain. That's opioid-induced hyperalgesia. You may want to wean the patients off the medications. Addiction is a huge thing. Diversion, if the urine is negative, even though patient says he's self-escalated and he's running out of medication and urine is negative, uh, that has to be taken into consideration. Self-escalation is itself a violation. Self-escalation can lead to respiratory de depression and, of course, comorbidities. It could be even diversion. So all these are very high risk factors. Uh, the other side effect, one has to be cognizant of the fact of other side effects, such as hyperalgesia, long-term use of chronic opiate therapy leads to hypogonadism. So some of the patients do want to be on testosterone therapy, but you want to get some blood work for that. Sedation, be careful in patients with co- um, with concurrent use of benzodiazepine, obstructive sleep apnea, who are not using CPAP, morbid obesity, one has to be careful. Cognitive impairment, if patients, elderly patients who have cognitive impairment, dementia, delirious, be very careful, even if you have a proxy assigned for them. Constipation is one of the number one side effects which are com commonly across, and it's, uh, it can be devastating. Patients can go to the ER and get an infection, can get an intestinal obstruction. So you need to have a very good bowel regimen if you're starting somebody on opiate therapy. Pruritus, it's not very common. If you have pruritus, just change the medication. Nausea and vomiting, not so much. Initially, maybe if patient is naive, but then they get used to it. Respiratory depression, central sleep apnea are big notorious side effects. One should be careful and one should provide naloxone to such patients. Anybody with comorbidities, anybody in a high dose, naloxone should be prescribed. Uh, opioid induced constipation, of course, conservative treatment, non-medication management. If they have failed their natural remedies, then you want to use medications such as, such as tool softeners or stimulants. We do have uh, very mu agnus specific medications. They can be used in case of early uh, severe constipation, but I would use in, in cancer-related constipation. Uh, monitoring, this is high. Once you started the patient on chronic opiate therapy, what do you want to do? They come to your clinic. You have to document all the five A's. Analgesia, are the medications helping? Without medications, what is your pain score? Are the medications helping you function? Without them, are you functioning or not? Adverse effects, aberrancies, your UDS, your RT scale, and your uh, history, whatever dictates aberrancy affect, psychosomatic interference, de uh, depression, anxiety, if they're not well controlled. And of course, urine drug test is a very simple method and that is, a, that is standard of care now since 2012. And you must assess for compliance, that is very important. Uh, these are the very simple tools that, we, that can be done in the office itself, at the bedside itself. The ORT, the OPR risk tool, is not a big tool. It's very easy to memorize and identify the risk factors. Uh, urine drug screen, review of medical records, again, payers, OPR prescription, getting information from your PDMP, all these will help you formulate a plan and document your risk status and if you will want to continue the chronic opiate therapy for such patients. Once you start your chronic opiate therapy, what do you want to do? According to literature, it suggests short term. I've never seen short term because most of my patients have been long term. Once I stop them, uh, things escalate. So I rather have them be on short term, uh, on the long term, but low doses. Uh, the decision to 
continue to be based on what we just spoke, all the five A's, functionality and pain improvement. And uh, outcomes to consider is are they meeting your goals, the functionality and pain outcome. And of course, they're not, they are devoid of any adverse effect. And patients with psychiatric illness or comorbidity should be periodically and closely monitored. So we have a patients with psychiatric comorbidities uh, visit our pain psychologist very, very frequently, and uh, they see us in the clinic once a month at least. Uh, these are the CDC guidelines, continuation, opioids are not the first line. Of course, we just talked about non-pharmacological uh, agents and non-opiate agents are the first lines. Then you consider a short-acting <coughs> agents, but the lowest effective dose. Reassess the patient, do not use more than 50 morphine equivalents. If they are more than 50 morphine equivalents, please send them to the pain clinic. For acute pain, it says only three to seven days. Do not prescribe more than seven days. When you, most of the patients, we start giving out uh, naloxone to a lot of the patients, even if they are on low doses like five, twice a day, phytocodone, that's because of the comorbidities like sleep apnea, psychiatric illnesses, prior history of substance abuse, prior history of risk factors. Um, anyone more than 50, this is the current recommendation, they do need a naloxone prescription. A urine drug screen is done before and routinely, which we just spoke about, depending on the risk status, PDMP data should be at least viewed once every two to three months, if not at every visit. And used evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder, uh, refer them to an addiction clinic for methadone treatment or suboxone treatment. Uh, high risk uh, patients recommendations for patients, history of drug abuse, psychiatric illnesses, aberrant behavior. Uh, one must implement frequent monitoring, close monitoring, once a week, once in two weeks, once a month, but it has to be very, very strict. And of course, you need to have a consultation with a mental, mental health specialist. And continuous evaluation. You want to restructure your therapy. You may want to discontinue narcotics and keep retrying on narcotic therapy. Dis discontinued chronic opioid therapy is strongly, strongly recommended in such patients. The psychotherapeutic co-intervention, this works very well, and we do know that evidence is very strong when you use the biopsychosocial model for chronic pain, and of course our mental health providers utilize this model to treat them. Uh, the physical therapy, it has a role too. It shows modest evidence. Chronic, continuous exercises every day is very helpful to release endogenous opiates into your system and for patient to feel better. Uh, maintenance of home exercise program is advocated. These are the other therapies which we integrate. Cognitive therapy, integrative medicine, herbal therapies, interventional pain procedures. We do a lot of injections to prevent escalation of any medication management or prevent addition of chronic opiate therapy. For any flare-up, any of such uh, pain disorders, we do do injections to prevent, again, increase in any medications. These were the July 2017 mandates. Everybody needs to be in the CRIS and uh, all long acting require prior authorization, but we are having difficulty for prior authorization for long actings. Uh, anyone more than 90 morphine milliequivalents require prior authorization and probably they will deny it. PDMP should be reviewed, opioid agreement should be obtained. We get an opioid agreement every year, not only once once before we start, but we renew it every year. Random UDTs, naloxone prescription, and addiction screening. These were the mandates in July in 2017. Medical marijuana is one of debate now. So a lot of patients who have been on marijuana before, they would like to uh, try the medical marijuana, but let's go to that first. Now it has been implemented in 2017, so a resident in Maryland can be approved and get, can get appropriate treatment. A provider can also be registered. Uh, for medical marijuana, the primary, they are like 500 chemical constituents, 100 of them are active, and of that, the THC is supposed to be psychoactive, causing you changes in your brain. And the cannabinoids, that is a non-euphorian cannabinoid with a very safety profile. It's very difficult to extract pure cannabinoid from the marijuana plant, unless it's hemp, and it's used mostly topical, a CBD ointment. So, medical cannabis, it can be helpful in relieving neuropathic pain. There's no evidence that it treats nociceptive pain, any pain in chronic pain. 
uh, fibromyalgia headaches, rheumatological illnesses, even cancer has been questioned. So medical cannabis does not alleviate any of the pain. Initially, patient says if they are medical if they are marijuana, oh yeah, it helps your pain. Once you start giving them the medical marijuana card, and then they say, oh, it helps my anxiety, not my pain. So it means they want to continue the opiates. I have not noticed that cannabinoids reduce chronic opiate therapy, but literature does suggest it does reduce chronic opiate therapy. The effect of cannabinoids does reduce over time. Patients do, do develop tolerance. So one. The for tolerance, switch the medication or stop the medication, restart it again, that helps the patients. Most of the medical indications on the left side and for chronic pain, it's mostly for neuropathic pain. So medical laws do state that the opioid dose or dose mortality rates have reduced and uh, it also uh, suggests that there's no increase in the adolescent use of marijuana with the medical marijuana and the various types and various forms to be ingested from this medical marijuana. So can the patient with medical marijuana drive? Uh, that's a questionable mark because the THC in it can cause euphoria, can impair the patient's ability to drive. Patient can develop tolerance against the myth, which patients said they do not develop uh, tolerance. Again, tolerance, like we said, discontinue, restart it. Uh, chronic back pain, uh, these are all the, medi uh, all the types of chronic pain syndrome which we treat patients with and we have a lot of interventions. I'm just putting a little bit of interventions to prevent uh, again uh, use of other medications. This is to supplement when patient has pain or patient says these, me these interventions have helped. So we do these, this is for an epidural injection when patient has a huge disc herniation and does not want surgery and uh, we do transferral epidurals so this goes along the the nerve root decreases the swelling and all the uh, substance chemicals around it and decreases the pain. This, however, the evidence for epidurals, it could be fair to uh, good. Uh, the transferamyls have a good, uh, there's good evidence that it's much preferable than just an interlamin epidural. Just local anesthetics alone may not prevent surgery. However, none of these injections prevent surgery. They are only short-term benefit. They have to be repeated. Uh, uh, the steroids which we um, uh, deposit to, we do not give a whole lot because we have a set amount. After that, patient may develop complications. So very cognizant of the fact of the tox uh, the maximum dose of the steroid that has to be injected. Uh, the reason why uh, patients say, oh, uh, this, uh, you know, it does not, a lot of uh, providers also say, oh, they don't help, just go for medication management or other non-pharmacological management is because of this. There are a lot of negative predictors. Does. If you identify a good patient, if they will be amenable to the treatment with injections, they can respond well. If you, that's proper patient selection, depending on that. Anyone, like we discussed, with high risk factors, prior surgeries, prior treatment failures, and uh, a litigation involved, all these are poor predictors. So they may not respond to any of these injections. And this is the one of the commonest injections which we do when patient has arthritis or facet involvement in the back. This is, uh, has very good evidence. Uh, almost 15 to 20 percent of the patients with back pain have facet arthritis. So what we do is we just go and block the nerve. It's a medial branch that supplies the facet joints. So we apply some medicine right here to numb the nerve. And at a later time, if, the, if, the, if they respond to it, we burn the nerve. And this can last like almost uh, six months to 18 months. Uh, and um, if the nerve regenerates, we go back and burn the nerve. This is quite helpful for most of our patients. Success is more in the neck than the lower back, but however, it can be successful. Uh, this is the neck injection, same thing, facet injections. We inject the medial branches in the neck and we burn the nerves later on. It's proven to be useful for headaches as well as neck pain. And this is the radiofrequency ablation that we burn the medial branches and this uh, can help from six to 12 months with facet mediated pain. And uh, these are the other injections, sacroiliac, almost 40% of them, or maybe 20% of them are affected. Most of them after surgery, this SI is involved. And um, the uh, it could help. SI injections have not been uh, proven to be that helpful as the facet injections, but this can be considered as well. This is one of the um, indications that the patient should be sent to the uh, pain clinic as soon as possible, CRPS. If you identify complex regional pain syndrome, the earlier we treat, 
the faster it improves, the longer we wait, it's going to be very challenging to treat. This is very, very disabilitating. Debilitating, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the uh, stellate ganglion block. The stellate ganglion is, uh, we try to block this chain which supplies the hand. We do a series of block, so it reduces the edema, it reduces the pain. In conjunction, we send them directly to physical therapy. Once the pain is reduced with the injection, they start moving around. The range of motion is improved, pain is improved. At least five to seven sessions are required to help patients with such pain and they do show a lot of improvement if they come in the acute phases. If they come in the chronic phases, it's going to be, it's going to be very challenging to treat. This is the same thing, CRP is of the foot. We do, we do sympathetic blocks for such patients and uh, same thing, five to seven blocks, send them to physical therapy, the increase, in, increase the range of motion, reduce pain. If it doesn't, then we go to spinal cord stimulators. That is uh, the last uh, resort to chronic pain management. Uh, patients with cancer pain, we do inject um, uh, phenol or alcohol for permanent destruction of the celiac plexus. This really helps the pain. And for terminal cancer, we would use all the neurolytic substances. For alcohol-induced chronic pancreatitis, we would use, a, we would perform celiac plexus block. It helps, it does help significantly, but if patient is relapsing again, with alcohol, then we do not perform. Patient intermittent with pancreatic flare-ups, this is one of the choices for intermittent pain management. Uh, uh, this is a hypergastric plexus block for pelvic pain, endometriosis, pelvic pain, for anal pain, for rectal pain, for vulvodyna, dyspareunia. This, uh, this is one of the injections. Uh, uh, this Pay, th these injections are not with our risk, but it is quite helpful in some patients, not all the patients. Uh, peripheral nerve blocks, these are quite helpful for patients with headaches, occipital nerve neuralgia. We inject the, we perform an ultrasound or blind. We inject local anesthetic or steroids around the C2, C3 occipital nerve, and it has been proven to be useful. If it doesn't help, we, uh, we turn to peripheral nerve stimulator modalities. And these are the intercostal nerve blocks for post-thoracotomy pain syndrome or for shingle pain. For shingle pain, which we commonly come across, it's quite helpful. You want to calm the nerves along the intercostal nerve. We perform an ultrasound and fluoroscopy, and we put medication right along the nerves, and it is quite helpful. It, re it really alleviates the pain. Uh, my fascial pain, this can be done even in the primary care clinic in your regular offices. Once you identify pain trigger points, you need to identify and mark them. And then uh, this is, these are the injections you could perform. But initially before you perform trigger point injections, you would advise non-narcotic pain, ma pain medications like NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, physical therapy, massages. Uh, narcotics are not indicated for any type of my, my fascial pain, not for fibromyalgia, not for locus type of my fascial pain. Uh, uh, for any muscle pain, narcotics are not indicated. But this injection can be done even in the, at your bedside. Identify the trigger points, go into the muscles, inject a little bit of local anesthetic or a steroid or a Botox or serapin, any medication that you would you're comfortable with but be careful if it's a lung we do them on ultrasound nowadays so if everything fails then we go to the most invasive therapies for chronic pain spinal cord stimulation intrathecal therapy again patient selection is very very important for a key success uh, these are the four indications which we normally commonly use chronic radiculopathy any neuropathic pain arachnoiditis fail back syndrome uh, so a spinal cord stimulator is, uh, this is a battery, there are electrodes placed in your spinal, in your epidural space, this transmits small electrical, uh, uh, electrical impulses to your brain, so it stops all the impulses, whatever you perceive, it closes the gate for all the pain impulses coming here, just close the gate so you do not perceive pain. And this is attached to a battery, you go home, you trial it, if it helps, everything gets internalized and implanted inside. It works for some, it doesn't work for some. So again, patient selection is very important. Uh, intrathecal therapy, we 
gotten away from this. We used to do uh, perform intrathecal pumps for patients on chronic opioid therapy for no septic pain or for neuropathic pain. Now we've only limited to baclofen pumps for spasticity and for cancer-related pain. Uh, again, this is a continuous infusion of medication from this uh, pump which delivers the medication through a catheter into your CSF. So uh, this has to be managed once a month or twice a month. Now we have bigger pumps, so they come in twice a month to replace the medication. Of course, it has its own side effects. Um, uh, this is the last, I think. Uh, again, the opioid epidemic, this is, we always reminded of this. It's because of these factors. Oxycontin in some way got away, but then it was, uh, ma it was uh, marketed as it was very safe. And the other problem is pain as a fifth vital sign, so we tend to overprescribe. Again, the Joint Commission framed that as a patient rights issue. Again, under treatment of pain, that was a big issue. A lot of legal uh, actions against that. The press gain is a huge thing. High satisfaction really is important. And it's noted that in the recent press gainy, the more narcotics you give, the higher mortality, mortality and morbidity rates are associated. So it's more on patient em uh, empathy, compassion, and communication uh, that would drive up our press gainy scores. Again, CMS is determined to pay for volumes, and now it's shifted to pay for value. So there's a lot of things that really interferes with that treatment plan. Uh, the bottom line is patient satisfaction. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Can you comment on the use of the Zetrazotomy to control uh, back pain? So, it's a radio frequency ablation. Um, we use uh, heat. In the past, there were other agents that was used, alcohol, phenol, like we just discussed, but we use thermal heat around 80 degrees to just, we, I, we isolate the sensory now. Once we go, we identify the area of target, we identify the medial branch where it resides, and then we stimulate, we ask questions if it's sensory versus motor, and then we, uh, we apply heat around 80 degrees for around one and a half minute. So that causes destruction of the nerve, but it can regenerate later on. So that's the basis, because the medial branch supplies the facet and all the structures around it, the skin, subcutaneous tissue, the medial, uh, everything within the spinal column. So it helps axial mid pain, basically. I would definitely recommend it. Would definitely, patient has only facet arthropathy on MRI. There's no necessity to put them on narcotics. I would just jump to facet rhizotomy. It treats the pain. They do well. So uh, I would definitely utilize intervention pain management to prevent the use of additional medications. Are there? When I looked at your slides, probably one third threw the way. There was one on the modulation of nociception. Right. And I thought the pathway may be from the peripheral end to the central. It is from the peripheral. Then voila, mm -hmm. in the middle of your slides, mm -hmm. there is acupuncture. Mm -hmm. My question is what is your experience or what group of patients in your practice actually benefit from acupuncture and whether they feel it in any head to head Western? Uh, oh, there has there has been a lot of evidence on acupuncture. In the past, it said acupuncture was not helpful. Even for acute pain, it was said that it was not helpful. But recent literature did show acupuncture is beneficial. But in my experience, I have not found to be very useful, except patients with concomitant mood disorders, or if they want to get off smoking, or if they want to, uh, uh, some of the factors that's involved. But I haven't noticed a whole lot of difference for such patients. This is all evidence-based. Uh, sorry? Uh, it could be, I'm not sure if it's placebo. It could be, but what I presented is based on literature, not on my experience. But in my experience, I have not, I have not noticed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but how about a cancer patient uh, 
end of life? Uh, I haven't spoken about uh, cancer patients, sickle cell, palliative care, acute pain. They have no ceiling. You could prescribe anything, but I will leave it to the specialist in that specialty. And the last thing is, uh, you, I didn't see any mention about a weight loss to reduce uh, back pain as, as a modality. That's in the integrated therapies. That's one of the factors. And uh, that's one thing we are really lacking on because we don't have appropriate nutritionists or any persons to refer to. Patients are motivated with the limb to have a gastric bypass. Very few subset of them do undergo uh, gastric bypass. I mean, they do participate in that sort of modality. But um, I haven't seen uh, much of people attempting to lose weight because the demographics are such. Our demographics are very different compared to the peripheral urban area, peripheral areas. Yeah. Well, would a significant weight loss alleviate a lot of this back pain? And if, then you have less medication? If you have pathology already set in, it's not going to be reversible. You're still going to have pain. At least you can prevent progression, yes. You can prevent progression. You can also prevent weight-bearing joints and everything which can get affected. Uh, again, prevent progression, I would say. It will not reverse the pathology. Patient will still have pain. You were talking about complex regional pain syndrome. That it can be effective to do um, sympathetic blocks yes. acutely. How, how long would you say before that it starts to become less effective that they've had this condition? Anyone more than two years is going to be less effective. But the first month, if you send them, they respond the best. I don't even have to go into spinal cord stimulation. I just do synthetic blocks, go to physical therapy, they come back walking. Patients who have not been walking, you send them, do all the multimodal approaches, they come back, and they do pretty good. And most of the new, uh, CRPS agents are not on narcotics too, so the earlier the better. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.